Good morning, and welcome to another broadcast of Medical Minutes, brought to you by Passivan Hospital. I am Dr. Peter Rosato, your host and moderator. Today's interesting topic hits very close to home, drug use trends among local youth. I have two experts with me today to help shed some light on this subject, Dr. Scott Boston and Heather Sweet. Both are members of the Morgan County Prevention Coalition. Now, a little background about our guest. Heather Sweet is a prevention specialist for the Well Center. She is a graduate of St. Louis University with a Master of Public Health degree. She is also a certified health education specialist. Heather has been working in, in the substance abuse prevention field, providing education to our youth. Her work with the coalition consists of mobilizing our local community and its representatives in an effort to raise awareness for the prevention of substance abuse in youth. Dr. Scott Boston is a board certified emergency room physician and the current medical director of the emergency room here at Passivan Hospital. He is a graduate of SIU School of Medicine and clinical assistant professor in the Division of Emergency Medicine at SIU. Dr. Boston has been with the Morgan County Prevention Coalition since 2012. I do want to welcome both of you. The abuse and misuse of prescription medications is a common trend among the nation's youth. Unfortunately, this is also a trend we are seeing here locally in Morgan County. According to the 2012 Illinois Youth Survey, Morgan County youth abuse prescription medications at a higher rate than overall Illinois youth. Having two teenage daughters myself, I can tell you this concerns me and should concern every Morgan County citizen. It is a real problem right here in our own community. Along with prescription medication abuse and misuse, we are seeing more synthetic drugs being used locally. With that being said, I'm going to turn to my local experts here and ask the question, what common prescription medications are the youth of Morgan County abusing and how are they getting these? Uh, Dr. Boston? Good morning. We're seeing a lot of increase in prescription drug abuse. We're seeing patients in the emergency room who have used medications that maybe were even prescribed for them to be used uh, in a legitimate way. We're also seeing patients who have uh, bought prescription drugs off the street. Both situations can be very dangerous, and it's something that is increasing in our community. Heather, do you have anything to add on that? No. What Dr. Boston had said about the kind of drugs we're seeing, prescription medication misuse especially is really popular among youth they can get it anywhere they can literally get it from their own medicine cabinets and at home and from their friends and they if they want it they just gotta say it ask somebody and then through the grapevine they'll get it uh, I know I briefly talked uh, earlier a little bit about the synthetic drugs and Dr. Boston can you go into where we're, what we're seeing in the ER as far as these synthetic drugs Synthetic drugs really hit the scene about 20 years ago in uh, central Illinois. Probably the one that people hear the most about is one called Ecstasy or Molly, and it is a synthetic amphetamine. It has similar effects on the body to things like speed or even Ritalin, which is a, also another amphetamine. These have been replaced with even more powerful synthetic drugs more recently. There's the synthetic marijuanas. These are often called K2 and oftentimes these were available until pretty recently in retail outlets. Uh, recent legislation has made it illegal to sell these now. But the pharmacists, actually what I would say is the uh, chemists that work for the drug dealers are pretty clever folks, and they're able to create new formularies for these drugs, and the legislation can't keep up with the new drugs that are being produced. So you'll have a, a class of drugs that was illegal. The chemist goes into the lab, changes the molecule a little bit, and you suddenly have a new drug that's available on the market that there's no technical law against. Some of the, the new ones that we're seeing now are what we call bath salts, and these act like amphetamines. And they're kind of a more potent version. And there's some even newer ones that often go by the names 2CE or 2CI. And these newer ones have, uh, in addition to sort of getting the speed effect, the sort of adrenaline flow effect, also are hallucinogenic and are causing uh, reactions in the user similar to things like what we saw when people were using LSD or PCP. So there's always a new drug on the horizon because the chemists are always coming up with new molecules. 
It's a, it's a pretty dangerous world when you look at the synthetic drug world. And the chemists are pretty sharp guys, and they can come up with new drugs, and it's hard for the legislators to keep up with them. So they're always one step ahead. So that's how the young teenagers continually get these drugs legally, so to speak. Absolutely. Okay. Uh, did you want to add something to that, Heather? Um, yes. Yeah, something I wanted to mention is uh, Dr. Boston mentioned bath salts, and there's a lot of confusion behind what bath salts are. A lot of people think it's those salts that people actually put into their bath. Um, I think I believe they're called Epsom salts, and some people believe that's what the drug bath salts is, and it's not. It's something you can buy in any kind of head shop, convenient shop, smoke shop that's labeled not for human consumption or yeah i've even seen them in the gas station convenience stores mm -hmm. uh for a while there I, I don't even know if they're still on the market but maybe like dr boston said they might have a, a new name now uh, just a little bit different chemical composition so that way the law can be circumvented is that correct Correct. The Illinois legislation has some very specific rules on board where it spells out specific molecules, specific drugs that are illegal, and they cannot be sold. But the problem is the chemist can change the molecule just slightly, and you still get the high, you still get the drug effect, but it's not technically illegal. So the um, drug enforcement agencies try very hard to keep up with the chemists. So, and I want our, our listeners to realize, just because we are a small little community, basically based on this survey, we, we have to realize that they're available here for our, our teenage youth and younger, probably younger adolescents are getting these drugs through many, many different means, correct? The age of the Internet has leveled the playing field. If you know how to use the Internet, you can order anything from anywhere in the world and get it shipped to your front door. There are kids that are getting a lot of these designer drugs from Internet shops. The ability to get these drugs uh, doesn't require a very savvy shopper. They're pretty readily available in the community. And that's the sad part about it is how readily available they are. Being a, uh, a parent of teenagers, uh, I guess we should talk about some of the warning signs any uh, a parent should look for in their young adolescent teenager who might be experimenting with drugs or uh, in some kind of drug trafficking, what, what, what should we look for? What to look for would be your very classic signs of drug abuse, uh, which include like dramatic changes in a child's appearance or their personality. So you would look for s changes such as school performance, their friends, if they're having new friends, their appearance, maybe how they talk to you or don't talk to you anymore. I would also suggests looking at how they interact with you when it comes to their medical needs, especially when it comes to pres prescription medications. If kids are starting to ask, like, hey, I need to go to the doctor because I feel this kind of pain, and it's not something they usually do, that, that would also be a warning sign, if whether they want to use it themselves, that kind of medication, or sell it. So you're saying like sometimes a warning sign could be a, a, a child's uh, interaction or social behavior like dropping out of sports or dropping out of activities would be something that could be a, a warning sign. Yes, it doesn't necessarily mean that they are doing drugs by any means, but it is a warning sign of some sort. Mm -hmm. and, and maybe sleeping patterns, uh, does that have anything else to do yes, with it? Yes, sleeping patterns, eating patterns definitely look for changes in those. Um, do you see any of that in, in your practice in the emergency room, Dr. Uh, Boston? Most of the patients that we see in the emergency room is because something has gone wrong. And a lot of times the patients we see are uh, overdosed. Mm -hmm. And so obviously if they're in, you have a patient that's in the emergency room because an overdose, it sometimes is a little bit too late. We would prefer that the parents have those conversations with their children before they end up in the emergency room. A lot of the cases we are able to treat and a lot of, you know, sort of young healthy people are able to survive a drug overdose, but some don't. I mean, we have drug overdoses that result in death uh, every year in our community. And in all age levels, I'm sure. In, in every age level. I mean, we, um, you have cases where you have uh, junior high kids having things called farming parties where the kids will go in the parents' um, the drug cabinet in the bathroom, pull out a bunch of bottles, and you'll have a bunch of 12-year-olds trying these pills out. And unfortunately, when you have you know, young kids that don't weigh as much, they're smaller, their metabolism's different, 
You know, a drug that maybe would be safe uh, at the adult dose is not at all safe at the uh, 12-year-olds. That's a that's a good point. That a, as uh, parents, we must be responsible and keep our drugs basically almost like our guns under lock and key because uh, we can't assume little Sally is not going to be the one to go into the medicine cabinet and, and experiment on these drugs. Correct? It, it's a it's a powerful motivator to experiment. That's part of the uh, maturation process going through your adolescence is um, exploring the world around you and. Fortunately, in the world around us right now, there's some dangerous drugs that are out there, and we uh, do need to limit the exposure of our adolescents to the things that experimentation would cause them harm. Peer pressure, too, of course, is a big factor in that, I'm sure. There's a lot of peer pressure out there. A lot of kids are um, need, need to fit in. They need a, a, a group. They need a, a social support network, and... There's a lot of uh, pressure out there to fit in. And if you're at a party and one of your friends says, hey, try the pill, you do. Yeah, that's the sad part. I, I got a specific question here for you, Dr. Boston. Do you ever see where maybe in the emergency room setting that maybe a, a parent brings in a child with su suspected use of uh, uh, any type of narcotic, synthetic drug or anything like that? Does that ever happen in, in your experience? Sure, and that actually becomes a little bit of a tricky medical legal situation. It becomes difficult for us to convince the patient oftentimes to submit to drug testing and that involves you know blood and urine samples and if the child isn't willing to cooperate it's awful hard for us to do that the other thing is that many of the drugs specifically the synthetic drugs are not testable we don't have good assays to determine if they're being used or not we have a lot of very good tests for sort of the classic sort of the old school drugs uh, the narcotics like heroin and barbiturates but a lot of the new designer drugs escape detection. But there's that dichotomy in there that when you have a teenager, I know if I see my child all of a sudden acting a little weird, there's the, only a fine line of time frame of what you need to act. So I guess uh, if you had to counsel a parent, if you suspect a high drug use or a possible overdose, time is of the essence, correct? And you would want them to bring them into the emergency room yeah. ASAP. If there's any question of altered mental status, change in respirations, difficulty breathing, those need to be seen immediately. Yeah. So that's what maybe a typical patient would present with uh, to the emergency room or so, uh, some of those signs and symptoms? So there's a, in the world of toxicology, we have something called toxidromes. And these are sort of a classic constellation of symptoms that patients present when they have overdosed. So uh, a classic overdose on cocaine, um, it would be a very rapid heart rate, very rapid respirations, be very sweaty, be very hyper, very ambitious, sometimes aggressive, can get very high blood pressure with it. And then another classic toxicone is kind of the opposite. These are the people who have overdosed on a narcotic. They have a very slow respiration, a very slow heart rate, very low blood pressure, they're not at all agitated or aggressive. And hard those, to arouse. Hard to arouse. And lethargic, so those individuals can actually become hypoxic, get low oxygen levels because they're not breathing enough. So it depends on which drug they've overdosed on, on how they'll appear. You have some patients that are very hyper, agitated, violent, and some that are very sleepy and depressed and maybe not able to breathe. So it really depends on which drug they've overdosed on. And prescription drugs and street drugs can have the same effect. Um, physiologically, your body doesn't really differentiate between a prescription drug or a street drug. Basically then, uh, we talk about teachable moments and everything. What can we give our listeners our teachable moments when they have an adolescent at home? There are lots of opportunities parents can take when it comes to talking to their child about drug abuse. Something that I recommend as a prevention specialist is to Maybe take some real-life events and use that as an opportunity to talk to your child about drug abuse. So let's say your child has a favorite music artist or an athlete and they just got in trouble, public trouble, with drugs. You could use that opportunity to sit your child down and ask them if they maybe understand what is going on with their you know, favorite celebrity or athlete. And then if they don't, explain to them and then give them some ideas of why it's dangerous and then also maybe talk 
about benefits of not using drugs. Kids also need to hear all the good things about not using drugs. They don't need to hear all the bad things constantly because that's just going to pique their curiosity. You need to let them know all the good things about not using drugs as well. Do you have anything to add on that? Dr. We do try to have a sort of an intervention moment in the emergency department. We have social services available, mental health workers, social workers available. And when people come in with a, a drug overdose or adverse reaction to a drug, uh, we try to get some counseling done at that time. And then part of it is, is, is you know, these individuals have, have, you know, developed sort of a serious problem, and we try to get them, quote, plugged into the system where they'll be referred to things such as uh, the mental health center, the well center, places where there's professional counselors, therapists, people who can sort of analyze what's the motive, you know, why are they using these drugs? Is this a mental health issue? Is this a uh, adolescent adventurous issue? Is this a, uh, a coping skills problem uh, so we try to the problem is in the emergency room that you know most of the time it's it's a very sort of busy hectic environment which doesn't always lend itself to the you know the best educational environment but we do hope we can sort of get them plugged into the system get them referred to the experts in these areas like you said it's not the best uh, uh, place but it is a start on the road to recovery it would hopefully be the beginning of the beginning and, uh, and not to compound the uh, uh, topic today, but I know we've been mas basically talking about drugs and prescription drugs and synthetic drugs, but, you know, alcohol is also in the mix, and sometimes that's the other thing. The uh, young adolescents and the teenagers mix the alcohol with the drugs and, and talk about a lethal concoction. I, to be perfectly honest, I, I rarely see an overdose where alcohol is not involved. It's uh, polypharmacy, multiple drugs is, is common. It's, it's probably the rule more than the exception. Alcohol is a disinhibitor, so oftentimes what happens is you end up at a, a party or a social event. They have a couple of alcohols readily available. It's cheap. It's not hard to find. And uh, whether you're in junior high, high school, or college, the kids get a couple of drinks. Their inhibitions are reduced and they become much more compliant with uh, drug abuse. Yeah, it's, it's starting down that wrong road. Basically, as we close here, I guess if uh, any of our listeners have any questions or want any more information, where do they go for this? Heather, do you have a um, numbers? They can contact me over at the Well Center. That number is 243-1871. And they can also email me if maybe they don't want to call the Well Center for any kind of information or concerns my email address is h s w e e t at wellcenter.org you can call me for any advice any maybe knowledge or even if you want to get involved with our coalition well, well thank you uh, dr boston you have anything you would like to close with just thanks for this opportunity it's uh, nice to be able to sort of get this out there and in the public's mind it'd be fine with me if i never saw another drug overdose in my career that would be great. That would be great. And, and so as we close, I want to say uh, thanks for listening and good health to all.